Hi everyone, Avlina from Arcadia here. Today on Inspire, we have Tony Yeo, former Vice President of Technology at IHG and General Manager in Consulting at Hewitt Packard. Tony is currently an Assistant Professor at the Singapore Institute of Technology and is exploring the different ways tech, design, and business can become a holistic experience. Hi Tony, great to have you and thank you for joining us. How are you? Thank you, Avelina. How are you? Thank you. I'm very well. Um, maybe you can just give a short introduction of yourself and what you've been doing and what you'll be speaking about today. Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. And as you have uh, mentioned, I used to be the original CIO for a hotel group company in the region. And uh, previously, I have done consulting and projects for Hewlett Packard in several countries uh, around the region as well. And currently, I'm uh, working uh, kind of an adjunct at the university, teaching students uh, around technology uh, for the second year bachelor's of hospitality degree students. Very interesting. Um, and what are you sharing today with us all? Right, so I think um, the topic that I would like to share with the audience is basically around how um, artificial intelligence could enable marketplaces and how you could actually soup up the marketplaces at to, to the next level, uh, basically using the availability of the data and then how do you actually use that uh, to uh, make the marketplaces a lot more intelligent in terms of how uh, you could actually direct and target customers uh, that use the marketplace itself. Wonderful. Uh, let's get started then. Right, so allow me to just share some slides and then we'll walk through uh, briefly about what uh, the topics would be. I will talk about, uh, I'll cover four topics basically, uh, give an introduction of uh, what uh, AI is, uh, the definition of it, and then look at data, which is kind of like the new oil, and then look at how AI and e-commerce work together and how does it enable marketplaces and give some examples of what uh, how people are currently using it. So AI, in, in brief, a definition of AI is basically, um, there are actually two forms of AI. And the, the basic definition of AI is that it's any intelligent agent or device that perceives the environment and take the uh, information and takes action based on the data that it collects and then maximizes its chance of successfully achieving its goal that's being defined for the system or the device. And that's what the broad definition of AI is. But within AI itself, I mean, there are currently two forms of AI. One is narrow AI, which is currently the current state of AI, which is a lot uh, very programmatic in terms of rules-based, and there's a lot of very human predefined rules of how uh, the systems should work. So that's kind of like the early stage of AI and it's still very uh, in an infancy stage. The goal is obviously to progress towards strong AI and strong AI is basically where you have already thought the system to be able to do human cognitive stuff uh, and it's able to recognize and it's able to perceive and then become autonomous and that's really called strong AI and those will be, I guess, what you uh, look into science fiction pictures about what strong AI would be, where you have uh, androids and smart intelligent robots, and that's where autonomous systems would be. And that is probably the goal in the future of what strong AI is. Now within AI itself, uh, it, there are many branches of what AI is, but uh, one particular thing about AI is called machine learning. And it's basically teaching machines to learn and it's actually how do you get the machine uh, giving them data and then how do you teach it to learn and then uh, basically then do some predictive analysis and then actually give you come some kind of a, perform some tasks or decisions based on that and that's what machine learning is now on the slide is basically what the, the, the a lot of ai systems try to achieve is using training sets so the training sets come in two forms. One is supervised training set, where the supervised learning is trying to teach the system how to classify information, how to classify it into discrete classes of data. So whether is it a cat or is it a dog, 
uh, is it a car or is it a bicycle, that kind of stuff. So it's trying to classify data and that's called supervised learning. The other class of data is also called unsupervised learning. So basically you're feeding it with a lot of unstructured data and that's not labeled, unlabeled data where there's no input and output pairs that you can correlate it to. And then teach the system how to cluster it, how to define it, and then say, how do you say group them together and say, oh, maybe if this cluster of data, they look similar in a certain way, and what would be the characteristics and the feature that are similar together? And therefore, the system then learns and say, when it comes across something of that similar pattern and nature, therefore, it belongs to that particular cluster. And that's called unsupervised learning. So by teaching the system a training set, in terms of how the data would be clustered or how do you actually uh, pair them together, uh, then the system will then extract these features. And then when the new data comes in, the algorithm is able to then infer and deduce based on that uh, training that is already learned and then give you a kind of predictive model of what that outcome should be or what is that decision that would come out from that algorithm itself. And that's basically what machine learning is. The more advanced thing about uh, machine learning is what they call deep learning. And this is where you hear about uh, the Go, the, how they taught the, the system to play Go against the Korean champion and beat the, the, the Korean champion in terms of playing the game of Go. And that's called deep learning. And deep learning is basically a very sophisticated form of machine learning, but it actually mimics the neural networks of our brain. So instead of just one branch of a learning model, it's going through several nodes of our neural network, uh, typical, similar to the brain, and then try to emulate it, and then try to do a lot of calculations and inference based on that. And that's called deep learning. So AI in itself is basically, uh, getting very sophisticated in terms of going beyond just programmatic rules to just to actually learn from the data and then try to make inferences based on that. And that's basically, a, I guess, a very high, broad, quick overview of what AI is. And so obviously, they, to do all this, uh, you need to have a rich set of data because a lot of it depends on the inputs of the data itself. And that's why data is the new oil. And obviously, data comes in several forms. The small data is basically data that is formatted, data that you could actually comes from reports, data that is, uh, is tabulated, uh, data that has uh, labels, and that's actually small data. So that's typically what we deal with, right? You transactional data that you, you use every day, and that's small data. Big data is actually aggregated data where you cannot decipher who that person, that data belongs to. So you don't, do not want the identity of the data itself, but you just want to study the patterns of the data. And that's really called big data. It's a very, uh, I guess, an uh, abstract set of the small data itself. And, and then the purpose of that is that you want to do the analytics of that to study the clustering, the patterns, the behavior. and you want to protect the integrity and the privacy of the source of the data itself. And that's why big data is important for that purpose. On top of that, when you have the data, then you also really need to have algorithms. And it's the algorithms that is really the part where it is sophisticated enough to try and to use the data and then it learns by using some kind of a curve fitting, whether it's a regression analysis or whether it is using some kind of a uh, exponential curve or some kind of a binomial curve where they're trying to fit the data along a certain uh, distribution curve and then figure out that as long as it fits the certain algorithm and therefore you would be able to make some inference based on that. The other thing about data is that it has to come from real-time data sets. The more real-time data sets that you have, obviously you're not just getting the algorithm to learn from fixed set of data. Every time a real-time data set comes in and feed into the algorithm, it's able to use that basically in the real time to do that deduction and inference. And that's why, that's why the real-time data sets is important. And that relates to this, the last point, which is edge computing, which is when you have all these cloud systems out there, 
you want to make sure that it is actually related to the Internet of Things, where out there you have the sensors that collects the data on the ground in the local uh, context. And the, where you collect the data is where you want to do the analysis. And then you want to do that analysis and make that decisions real time in the local context. And so that's why uh, edge computing is becoming very important because of all the sensors that's going to be out there collecting the data. So why is AI so important and why e-commerce and marketplace needs to now get to the next generation where it has to be AI enabled? If you just put out a marketplace and then hope that you would do uh, people come and get attracted to your marketplace and come and do a transaction, that's probably a lot too passive. But with AI, you want to enable and soup it up in such a way that it's able to do customer-centric search. And you want to search not just based on text, but you want to maybe search based on image to allow people to search based on natural language, something like Siri, for example or even Echo from Amazon. So you want to allow people to use voice-based search or image searching. So that's basically how AI will help you do it. And I'll explain an example later on about how image search works. And then the other thing is that once you have all this data, you want to actually use the data to do customer targeting a lot better and then to improve the recommendation engines, right? So if you go to, go to the Amazon store, for example, if you've searched something, it will actually tell you, you know, people who have searched this uh, or they have looked at your past searches and then say, hey, maybe this is something that you would want to consider. So the recommendation engine uses a lot of intelligence to try and figure out what you have, your past behavior is and then do some recommendations based on that. Other, other marketplaces have uh, also introduced things like chatbots, where instead of uh, having humans that you will go there, you will go to their webs, to their marketplace, and then you start to initiate a chat. And then the chatbot, based on uh, the kind of uh, questions that have been asked globally or everywhere else, or people who have interacted with the system, they collected all these interactions and then try to put some intelligence around it and then put some guesses in terms of you are chatting about something and an issue that you're trying to ask or a problem that you want to solve, then the chatbot will try and interact with you pretty much like a human. But instead of talking to a human, you have the chatbots that you're talking to and then it's supervised by humans. Likewise, you have virtual assistants where instead of you uh, always monitoring uh, a particular deal on a marketplace, for example, that sends you alerts, then virtual assistance is probably something that you would configure uh, to your particular preference and then say, go out there and search for me certain things and, and be alert and, and send me messages in case such a deal comes up. So you are basically sending out kind of like an avatar out there for you to shop uh, in a marketplace and that was virtual assistance would be. Other, other ways where you could actually use AI would be improving your back office logistics, for example, processing of invoices, processing of fulfillment, uh, in terms of fulfillment of logistics, in terms of sending packages, trying to figure out uh, the survey, carrying out customer survey and stuff like that. So again, collecting a lot more data as well. And that was where AI could actually come in to help in the back office logistics as well. So these are four, kind of like four uh, key areas perhaps uh, people could explore how current marketplaces could get to the next level by implementing some kind of AI uh, behind uh, the systems. And, uh, and, and, and the next slide will show you what are some of the examples uh, where people have used AI and creating AI marketplaces. Uh, one example is uh, Nuance Communications in the US where they are trying to create a kind of a healthcare marketplace platform where uh, doctors who come up uh, to that marketplace could actually use it to do diagnostic imaging. So people sending in a lot of uh, x-rays and stuff like that. And in the future, obviously, the prediction is that radiologists will be out of a job in probably less than 10 to 15 years because the marketplace is going to have a lot of this data out there and uh, you know, the, the AI systems is, is basically going to be able to read an x-ray and do some radiology diagnostics based on that. And that's what uh, kind of a, a marketplace for 
the exchange of uh, uh, data based on uh, x-rays and medical imaging out there. The other example is Alibaba, for example, introduced this image matching service for clothes. The idea is that people may have seen somebody, a celebrity, wearing a particular fashion clothes and they have seen it in a magazine. They take the cutout from that or take an image of that and then put it in as a search. And then Alibaba's website, especially in Taobao and all the other online websites, will then go and search based on the image itself and then present uh, you the, the closest kind of image that is in terms of what that uh, particular photo of the dress or uh, clothing and, and shoes or whatever that you have seen and propose that to you as a recommendation. And that's what uh, Alibaba is using or uh, doing in terms of image search. The other example is uh, Philips, for example, is introducing an AI platform for healthcare. Again, another marketplace for healthcare uh, professionals to come there and then look at analytics in terms of the data that people submit up there and data scientists and researchers, clinicians, and there's a lot of data that's been collected around uh, patients and healthcare and that they could use that platform and then use some anal analytics that's out there to actually probably uh, create some campaigns or create some systems or create some analysis based on the healthcare platform that is AI enabled. And that's basically what Philips is trying to do as well. So uh, in a nutshell, I think AI has a lot of potential uh, in terms of the next generation marketplace of how you can enable it and to make sure that the marketplace is no longer just very passive and transactional, but it could actually transform it to become a lot more proactive and to become a lot more uh, relational. And that's, that's where I think AI marketplaces will become in the future. Okay, Evelina, back to you. That was a really great overview and summary of like what's going on in AI and you know, just understanding the basics of it. Because I know that you know, so much of AI is being talked about right now and data and privacy. Um, so it's definitely a very big topic that's on everybody's mind. Um, and I'm sure that everybody listening has lots of questions. I know that I have lots of questions and want to pick your brain on. Sure. Um, so to start with uh, data, the new oil, that's what you mentioned. Um, huge right now. There's so much data out there. And a lot of people, when they start their businesses, they start and start collecting it, but they don't really know what to do with it. So what's a good place for somebody to start? And how do you figure out what you actually need to look at? Right. So um, always begin with the end in mind. And obviously, it has to be very customer centric. And obviously, the objectives would be how do you use the data? And then it has to be how do you use it for the benefit of the customer? And obviously, if it benefits the customer, and then definitely it would benefit the business. And so when it's very customer-centric, you're collecting the data towards that particular goal in terms of, for example, reducing their search time, uh, reducing your transaction time, and therefore reducing their, to recommend them something that is probably closer to what they're looking for. And that therefore, that would be one particular goal that you would actually focus your data collection and the purpose of that, right? So start with that. And then the second bit is therefore, you need to make sure that the integrity of the data is accurate. And therefore you want to collect data in a way that it protects integrity and privacy, where you're only doing it for the behavior and the pattern, but you're not actually trying to be too intrusive. And therefore, the way you collect data has to be in that way where it is aggregated enough and it's not too, uh, I guess, too specific that you could actually uh, be intruding their privacy. Very interesting. Um, how would one know how intrusive they are collecting data or not? Well, if it is too granular where you could really identify the source, then it is too granular and it is an intrusion of privacy. Right. And as well, yeah. it is to, you can I, go back to the identity, then it becomes an issue. Mm, very true. 
Okay. Um, so on the subject of this, uh, what are some of the most common mistakes companies make when they are collecting or analyzing their data? Well, I think it's the question is that not just collecting it, right? And first of all, is the formatting has to be in the way that you could actually uh, preferably do it in a structured way, so that you could actually do uh, what I what I said earlier, which is the supervised learning, which is a lot easier for you to start with. So it has to be structured and formatted. That's one. The second thing is that you collect so much of it and if you don't do anything with it, then there, there is a recency issue. If the, da da the data is not fresh and it is becomes uh, outdated, then you're analyzing uh, basically on the historical data that doesn't make sense, right? So mm. there, there is a recency issue with, with it as well. And therefore you want to make sure that you do not wait till it's too long before you actually do that analysis as well. Mm, gotta keep it recent. Obviously, since trends change very quickly and customer behavior also changes very quickly. There you go, yes. Um, so as, along that train of thought, and your, with your experience with IHG and Hewitt Packard and you know, now at SIT and seeing all these businesses and how they work, what do you think is some information that companies tend to underutilize or overlook um, that AI can help with? Well, um, I think basically feedback, customer feedback. And uh, I mean, you, you, you have to treasure feedback as uh, a gem, a diamond, because when customer gives you feedback, if you treat it as a complaint and, and, and a failure, rather than treating it as a learning, then that's an issue. Because feedback is very precious. Okay? And that's the most important piece of data that could actually feed into the learning loop that you create. And that's basically, I think, very underutilized. And, and based for basically, uh, Customers are being very genuine and being very honest, giving you feedback about where you could improve. And if you don't tap on that and then use that to, to learn and improve, then uh, that's really a, a challenge, right? Because you're one, that's one source of information of how you could get better the next time around. And, and I see a lot of it is where people send, uh, customers send in a lot of queries, questions, it goes into a, generic mailbox, nobody attends to it. Uh, feedback that comes in, it's just not analyzed and, and that's lost uh, opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I think we keep on hearing more and more and we see it everywhere and even with all the speakers that have been coming on Inspire, we hear so much about feedback. You really need to listen to the customers to understand what's really going on. And then sometimes a lot of companies are too focused on what they think the customers want rather than actually listening to the customers. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so currently, AI seems to be used mainly by large companies or very smart high-tech companies. Um, is AI accessible to anyone and everyone? And what are some affordable ways, um, like the ones that you mentioned, that we can incorporate AI? Do you have any favorite companies or applications yeah. that you would suggest? So uh, Google Net. Amazon Web Services, they are actually providing a lot of AI uh, platforms out there now where people could actually use those platforms uh, and I think maybe in the future where marketplaces could hook into some of these platforms, you could actually use that to do your ana analytics a lot faster and I think that's the hope of Amazon Web Services is to provide that and Google Net uh, as well. And there are lots of startups that are now focused on providing a lot of uh, AI, I guess, uh, APIs or AI hooks that you can actually use in the system. So yeah, there are lots of those coming up as well. I guess it is really important because a lot of people, you know, AI is such a hot topic and everybody just wants to incorporate it as quickly as possible and they don't really look at um, or they don't know how to analyze their business in the sense of where it's needed most. Um, whether it's a chat bot, like you mentioned, or if it's a recommendation tool, how would you recommend 
a small business or an entrepreneur who's just getting started, how, who maybe can't afford to talk to a, um, you know, AI architect, how would you suggest that they analyze their business so they can kind of see maybe in triage what they think is most important to maybe first bring on and try out AI? Right. So um, I think you, you, you need to look at the volume of the business and then you look at that volume of the data that comes with it and then look at missed opportunities. Okay. If you analyze with that framework of the, the transactional volume and then the data itself, and then you look at where are the missed opportunities and then start with that and then look at, you know, first of all, it's obviously get the basics right. Your transactions has to be right. right? <laughs> and if you are actually having a lot of complaints and fulfillment issues, then maybe start with that. How do you solve those things, right? Get that into some kind of analytics to figure out. And then you look at predictive analysis, which is where else do people think you could actually target? And that's where the next part is, where you could actually do the prediction and then you can actually be more proactive to try and do the campaigns after that. So get the basics right, obviously. The transaction has to be right. When somebody orders something from your marketplace, it has to work and then the fulfillment has to be done. <laughs> And if you're getting a lot of feedback and if it's, there are broken processes, then those things need to be analyzed and needs to be fixed first. And then you collect the data and then you move on to the next stage, which is how do you predict and then how do you campaign and be proactive? As far as programming for AI, what language do you think it will, or do you believe it will be for the future for it? Is it Python um, popular with machine learning? Will it have a future with AI? Yeah, I, mean, uh, I think the easiest one, some, a lot of people are using, and it's probably not that fantastic, but things like Octave. Uh, people are using Octave, and um, yeah, I mean, you could still go back to Java, which is still very rudimentary, but a lot of it is to do with statistics, right? Because a lot of it is about probabilistic programming. It's about making guesses, right? And that's what uh, a lot of all this computing now is moving towards. Is if you have a statistics degree, you are, have an advantage in terms of how you do AI because it's all, a lot of it is about probabilities and how do you teach it to do the inference and the deduction based on probabilities. Very true, yeah. Statisticians out there, you did a good job setting the right thing for the future. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so everybody just, you know, embrace the change, embrace the technology, read up on it. I mean, it's still obviously very nascent, but a lot of things will probably be changing. Um, and it's a very interesting field and segment of technology right now. Yep. That's all we have for today on Inspired. Thank you again, Tony, so much uh, for joining us and sharing all your insights on AI and marketplaces. And thank you everyone for tuning in on today's session of Inspired. Until next time, be inspired. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.